this is something that most of us have experienced, if not once, twice, three times, et cetera. Um, there are a few five or sixes out there, I think. Uh, and if we haven't experienced it for ourselves, it's something that we're going to encounter, whether it is in a rider that we're watching or it's, you know, in a bicyclist who, you know, crashes on the side of the road while we're driving home from work. So I think these are some really important issues to understand just to the community as a whole. And I'm going to try to kind of explain things in as basic a way as I can so that you guys can walk away from here with an understanding of what concussion is, how you figure out whether a person has had a concussion, and what you do about it once you figure that out. The next slide. Uh, I'm also going to touch on um, an issue that I think is really important in the equestrian community right now, and that's the issue of return to play. How do we decide that someone that's had an injury is okay to go back to competition, either in the same competition or in subsequent competitions? So first of all, again, a definition. A concussion it means nothing more than a transient or temporary trauma-induced alteration in brain function. That's a pretty broad definition. It's important to understand that a concussion does not require a loss of consciousness. And in fact, there is a loss of consciousness in only about 10% of concussions. It's a commonly misunderstood fact. Uh, within the athletic population, obviously concussions are fairly common. The duration of symptoms between athletes is highly variable. Uh, most athletes are going to recover completely within a period of several days from a sports concussion. However, about 15% of athletes will continue to have symptoms of their concussion a year after their injury. Also very important to understand is that someone who's had one concussion from any cause is about five times more likely to sustain a second concussion than someone who's never sustained one in the first place. So something about this really lowers the threshold for future brain injury, and we don't understand that entirely on a, on a basic level. So how do we diagnose a concussion? It's very important to understand this is not something that we diagnose based on a CAT scan, an MRI, um, an EEG. This is something that we diagnose really based on, upon, uh, upon clinical signs and symptoms. It's based on what the athlete tells us they're experiencing as well as what we observe about their behavior and their neurologic exam. So within that, there's a really serious problem in the athletic population in that most athletes want to get back on the field as soon as possible. They want to show you that they're okay, and there's an inherent problem in, in symptom reporting. Oftentimes, people downplay the symptoms they're having to try to prove that they're all right and they can get back on the horse. Um, the, critically, to really diagnose a concussion well, you need to have an on-site or very early assessment of the athlete by a personnel that's trained to really identify brain injury and concussion specifically. In some cases, that may be a physician. In some cases, that may be EMS personnel. In some cases, that may be a sports trainer. Uh, there are certainly EMTs out there that I think are not really equipped to diagnose this, just as there are physicians that are not really equipped to diagnose this, because it's not something that they see and treat frequently. And uh, the, the critical thing is this is somebody who's kind of up to date on what we know about concussions right now and how we manage them. So what are those signs and symptoms? This is probably the most important slide. There's a lot of things up here. But basically, we see people that appear dazed or stunned. They're confused about their assignment. They're confused about, you know, that, that refers to football players usually, but they're confused about what it is they're there to do. Um, they forget the play or they forget, you know, the rest of their course. Um, they're unsure as to what their score is right now. Uh, they're moving clumsily. They're answering questions slowly. Uh, obviously, loss of consciousness, that is in and of itself, that's plenty. That's diagnostic of a concussion. Um, they show behavior or personality changes that just don't seem quite right. Uh, sometimes that's not obvious to a stranger, but it may be obvious to somebody that knows that person a little bit better. Uh, certainly, any kind of amnesia, whether they forget things that happened immediately before the accident or they repeatedly have to ask you what happened over and over again, uh, that's clearly indicative that the concussion has taken place. In terms of some of the symptoms that they're going to be experiencing, headache is probably number one. Um, it's normal for anybody, obviously, that has even a minor blow to the head to have a brief amount of pain, but a headache that lasts more than just a couple minutes is pretty suspicious. Uh, nausea is an immediate red flag to me. Um, balance problems or dizziness, disequilibrium, those sorts of things. Any kind of double vision, sensitivity to light. A uh, person may feel sluggish or lethargic. 
They may just feel kind of foggy, like they just can't quite get a handle on what's going on. And then concentration problems and changes in sleep typically happen later, a few days after the injury. And overall, this person may feel very fatigued. Just basic activity may really wear them out uh, compared to their normal self. Next slide. So, as I said, the most common symptom overall is headache. About 55% of people with a concussion will complain of a headache. Dizziness is also very common, and vision changes, whether it's blurred vision or double vision, is pretty frequent. Uh, almost half of athletes that have concussions will experience cognitive or memory problems in the immediate period after their injury, and most of those things clear up, but not in every case. As I said, only about 10% of athletes will have a loss of consciousness with a, con uh, with a concussion. So how do people figure this out, out in the real world? Um, there were a series of questions that were published back in 95 uh, for use by athletic trainers in football games, baseball games, et cetera, that I think are really relevant to what we have to do with people that we see that have a fall. These are obviously geared toward football, but you can imagine they could be geared toward any other sport. You know, what field are we playing at? What team are we playing? Who's our opponent? What quarter is it? Who, sc who scored the last point? What team did we play last week, and you know, did we win? You can imagine, if someone can't answer those questions clearly, an athlete that's in the middle of a rigorous competition, then something is not working well. And that's a good kind of screening tool, questions like that, you know, what, what fence did you just jump? You know, uh, what was your, you know, how, how'd you do in dressage? You know, what was the last event you went to? What event are we at today? You know, those kinds of questions can very quickly pick up someone who's not quite thinking the way they should be. And if somebody can't answer those things, as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're very suspicious for a concussion and they shouldn't be going back out to play. Next slide. There are a lot of people that have tried to come up with a lot of different grading scales for concussions. The bottom line of the slide is that we don't really use these very often anymore. As far as I'm concerned, there's not really such a thing as a mild concussion, a severe concussion. It's hard to tell from the offset how an individual is going to react to the injury that they've had. So I don't think there's a lot of use to trying to grade these things at this point. Instead, we try to define concussions based on a few different things. The nature and the duration of the symptoms that they have. So if someone has symptoms that go on for a long time, I'm much more worried about that person. Uh, the person's age, younger people are more susceptible to uh, more long-lasting, more severe neurologic problems after concussion. And then, of course, their previous concussion history. This really plays a role because we know that people that have been concussed before don't necessarily have as much reserve, and they're going to react, they're going to respond slower and recover slower from subsequent injuries. Uh, it's also really important to know, as I said, in the overwhelming majority of cases, imaging of the head that we have readily available to us is going to be normal. So this means that the person that, go, that seems like they're acting all out of sorts, they're vomiting, they've got a headache, they go to the ER, they get a head CT, and they're told it's normal, that does not mean that person did not have a significant head injury and a concussion. All that means is there's nothing structurally apparent that we can pick up on those imaging modalities. Uh, that does not mean that they're checked off and they're fine to go back to whatever activities they want to. Treatment is um, a really short slide because, unfortunately, there's not a lot of treatment for concussion other than rest uh, and allowing the brain to heal itself. So the most effective strategy that we have from a treatment standpoint after an injury has happened is allowing the brain to fully recover before returning to exposure to another injury. As I said, the average duration for an athletic concussion is about three and a half days. About 80% or so of athletes are fully recovered after about a week. Uh, that's, you, that's a rough estimate to how long somebody needs to be completely at rest before they can go back to athletic activity in a lot of cases. Uh, I touched on this earlier in the, my previous talk, um, the idea of second impact syndrome, something that was published initially in 1973. It's been documented and, and recorded in the literature in maybe 30 or so patients. This is what happens when you have an athlete who sustains an initial head injury, usually just a concussion without any structural changes on imaging, and then has a second head injury before those symptoms have fully cleared and has a sudden irreversible neurologic syndrome take place. And as I said earlier, this is really believed to be basically related to edema in the brain itself or swelling in the brain that may be related to loss of the regulation of blood flow to the brain tissue. And there's a 50% mortality rate with this syndrome. So half the patients that, that, under, that have this syndrome die. 
and there's a 100% morbidity rate. So 100% uh, of patients that have been recorded to have a syndrome like this have gone on to have long-standing permanent neurologic deficits. Finally, it's important to know that even though that syndrome is rare, it's very common to see delayed worsening of symptoms after a concussion. Just as an example, uh, in a college football study, they found that 33% of players who returned to play prior to the full and complete resolution of their neurologic symptoms experienced delayed onset of symptoms at that time, as opposed to 12% that waited completely, fully recovered, and then went back. The bottom line is if you go back into activity and you start having problems, you need to take a step back and take a rest again. So what do we do to figure out whether people are really ready to go back to play? Um, this is an important issue and a difficult issue to tackle, uh, especially for the equestrian community where a lot of our accidents take place outside of competition. And the most important things to realize up front is that individual neurocognitive baselines are, are critical. You're not necessarily comparing apples to apples when you're looking at every different athlete. Um, the best way that we have now, I believe, to measure someone's baseline neurocognitive ability is uh, through a fairly rigorous computerized testing program that asks you to perform a variety of tasks related to concentration, memory, reaction time, um, verbal and uh, visual attention. And in the old, old days, by which I mean five years ago, these, these tests had to be administered by a neuropsychiatrist with a pen and paper, and there was a battery of tests that took hours and hours, days and days in some cases. Uh, there have been a lot of efforts to create sort of a rigorous computerized testing program that will measure athletes' baseline abilities and then their abilities after an injury to try to make this more available to a broader uh, collection of people. And they've been pretty useful. Um, they provide a kind of a reproducible assessment of somebody's skills. So the idea here is that if an athlete takes a baseline test and comes back a year later and takes it again, they should get the same score. And these tests have been pretty rigorously um, composed to do that. So the test that you'll probably hear the most about and that's the most widely used right now is a test by a company called Impact. Uh, basically, this involves a questionnaire about your own concussion history and health, um, a symptom scale. So this is after a person's had a concussion. They go through a variety of items questioning the athlete about whether they're having all these various symptoms of concussion. And then they go through uh, about a two-hour, hour to two-hour long uh, computerized test looking at all those things I mentioned, processing speed, et cetera. And then it provides a report. And impact works ideally when you have a baseline test for someone and then you can compare after they've had a possible head injury. So this is just a graph uh, taken out of a football population showing the blue line is essentially normal subjects tested over and over again over a period of eight days. You can see it's, you don't actually learn this test and start doing better over time. It's pretty carefully formulated so that that doesn't happen. The red line is an example of people that have a concussion and then how they improve slowly after that time, slowly returning to baseline. And if you continue to follow this out, they get back up to their baseline, you know, usually anywhere from three days on up to a couple of weeks after a concussive injury. So who uses impact now? It's actually a lot more people than you would expect. All NFL teams in the country, all NHL teams in the country use impact for baselines and for their assessments of uh, their athletes after injury. Most Major League Baseball teams use it, seven NBA teams. Uh, in addition, a variety of U.S. Olympic teams, soccer, hockey, skiing, boxing. And I'm happy to say that the U.S. Eventing Association has just begun this year uh, performing baseline tests for the high-performance riders uh, and offering to then test them subsequently if they have any uh, head injuries. And we're just working on really ramping up that program, but that's something that ha potentially has applications across equestrian sports. So the bottom line is, there's policies in place within the NCAA, the NFL, the NHL, and all published practice parameters that support this type of testing as a standard of care for athletes with sports-related concussion. This is a problem for us because we don't do this for the vast majority of our athletes. 
Uh, I think it opens us up to liability issues. It also doesn't allow us to take as good care of our athletes as we want to. We don't have a mechanism right now for proving that somebody is okay to go back, and we're potentially um, allowing people to go back and, and ride in subsequent competitions, et cetera, who aren't ready and may suffer a significant accident because of judgment issues, visual processing issues, et cetera. Uh, just this last year, the NCAA uh, published a new rule that says that student athletes diagnosed with a concussion shall not return to activity the remainder of the day, period. Medical clearance is determined by the team physician or their designee according to the concussion management plan, basically saying, you know, if, if there's a suspicion, high suspicion of a concussion, you're out, period, the end for the day until you've been cleared. And one of the key things here is that you need to be cleared by somebody who has experience treating concussions. This is not your dermatologist, probably. Um, this may not be your primary care doctor. Uh, we deal with a lot of physicians that, you know, have not had up-to-date training on sports medicine and don't understand, you know, what, what the rule, real rules should be for diagnosing these issues and clearing somebody to come back. And that's an issue in the sport in general. Just asking somebody to come back with a piece of paper signed by a doctor saying that you can go back to competition is probably not adequate. So what do you do? Uh, you can click through this for me. Um, when you're ready to come back, the key is you rest first. You start with some light aerobic exercise. If you tolerate that, you go back to light sport-specific training. Then you go back to what they call in football non-contact drills. I'm not exactly what, sure what that means when you're riding horses, but uh, then back to your full contact drills and finally back to your competition. For some people, after a significant injury, this may occur over the course of a couple of weeks. For other people, like highly trained NFL athletes, you may go through these steps in a day or two. Um, but it just depends on the individual athlete. And the key point is, if at any point along the way, you so suddenly develop recurrence of symptoms, you stop everything, and you go back to the beginning, and you go back to rest, and you wait until those symptoms have completely resolved, and then you start back slowly again. So what is the maximum number of safe concussions? We don't know. I wish I could say that it was three, because then most of us in the room, room could bleed, <laughs> breathe a sigh of relief, including myself, but it's probably not. It's probably zero. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects of each individual concussion are, but we know that people that have numerous concussions over the course of their life, particularly when they're young, seem to be more at risk for some sorts of neurodegenerative problems as they grow older, including early dementia and things along those lines. So if we can't really treat this problem, obviously the best solution that we have is to try to prevent it. Slide, please. And obviously the best way we have to prevent this is to use helmets. I'm not saying anything that anybody in here hasn't already <laughs> heard today. This is the best way we have to prevent severe brain injury. There's multiple examples worldwide where mandatory helmet rules have changed the face of uh, the epidemiology of traumatic brain injury. The other thing I'll mention is that rule changes and changes in technique matter too. It's not just wearing a helmet, it's the way that you play the game. Uh, some examples of that in our country would include changes within the NFL, no direct helmet to helmet hits, no hits on a defenseless quarterback, um, penalties in, hockey, in the National Hockey League for high sticks, all those things are important in terms of injury prevention. On the equestrian side of things, I'm pretty proud that we've had a lot of changes in the last year that have really moved our sport in a positive direction. USEF's changes to uh, mandatory helmet rules for eventing and for dressage has been a big step in the right direction. The US Polo Association's also been working very hard to get adequate and, and uh, top of the line helmets really for their players and to mandate their wear. We're also working pretty hard on some return to play rules, and I think that's the next big step that we need to focus on. We need to get people in helmets, and then beyond that, understanding that accidents are going to happen, we need to figure out what to do with them when those accidents happen so that we reduce their risk of having a subsequent and more severe injury. So, you know, this is obviously the bad example picture. Uh, this is me not wearing a helmet. Um, I, I put this up here just to say that. I understand the tradition of the sport. Um, I really, Tanya's talk really reson resonated with me because she talked about how we all sort of have a different tipping point uh, in terms of where we make some changes for the way 
we, um, we live our lives and how we feel about safety equipment. I'm someone who always wore a helmet pretty, you know, all the time except uh, when I was competing, maybe my upper level horse in a, in a hunt cap and dressage and then, you know, obviously in FEI events. Uh, I really didn't come to the point where I changed my opinion about that until a couple of years ago. And what it took for me was seeing many head injured patients over and over again and then sitting there and thinking about all the time and effort, exhaustive effort in some, some cases, that I've put into my career and, and those goals and realizing that I was risking all of those things for something that's really very silly. Uh, it's obviously, it's some, I think that the key from her talk is that it's going to be something different for everybody. And I think it's important that we all realize we probably everyone in here has ridden without a helmet once, twice, or 10,000 times. We've all kind of come through this uh, process on our own and it's about now trying to figure out how we help other people enter that process themselves. So just to summarize kind of from earlier and now, the long-term effect of multiple sports concussions are still a little bit of a mystery to us. We don't know how many concussions are safe, but it may be none. Uh, the best thing we can do is to try to prevent them with proper equipment. And then what we've learned from looking at other sports and other regulatory agencies is that there's increasing scrutiny from players, from players associations, from the media, et cetera. Uh, we are in a situation where we have a lot of liability, uh, and those are, those are things that, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to, we can't ignore. Um, I think there's liability with regards to helmet use. There's also a lot of liability with regards to how we diagnose concussions that occur at our competitions and how we make decisions about return to play. And I think those are the next big steps that we have to make, even in the sports like eventing that have really done a lot to adopt universal helmet rules. We still have a lot of work to, to a lot of, a lot of um, work to be done to make sure that we keep those sports as safe as possible for their, our competitors. And finally, I'd just like to thank Lindsay and uh, Dr. Farrell for having me here and all of you all for listening and take any questions that you have.